is this on? Hello, is this on? So why don't we do? So why don't we do? Then maybe. Then maybe. We'll both talk. We'll both talk. Hello. Okay. Hello. Okay. It's not bad. It's not bad. Hi everybody. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Ella um, Mahoney. I'm, I'm the national political the national political of the Democratic Socialists of, the Democratic of, America. Socialists of uh, America. Thank you all uh, so thank you much all for coming so tonight for to coming tonight to our to event. Our uh, event. We, uh, this we, is organized by this is organized by New York City's City International DSA's Committee, International which Committee, is formed which is to bring some internationalist politics to our socialist movement here in New York City to do educational events like educational events like this. Help people connect uh, to, to help people social connect movements, to social movements, movements workers around the movements, world, right? Around so the world, if you are right? interested, so if you are interested in getting involved in getting that committee, involved the sign in that committee, right the sign up door, is right um, outside the door, and, um, uh, and, and you can uh, look up DSA online at USA.org. We also have a few. We also have a few hosts for this event tonight, which include Jacqueline Magazine, tabling right over here, right over here, in which both of our panelists have written for about France and about France and about. Environmental uh, uh, and many other things, um, and many other things. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, Jacqueline is having actually is a release having party for their new issue on the issue financial crash on the crash on Thursday. On Thursday. Uh, back here at Verso uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, New, uh, New York City DSA environmental justice, environmental justice also working group also this co-sponsored along this event with the International Socialist, Socialist, International Socialist Organization, which Jonah here is a member of a distinguished member. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna. All, all that said, now all, that I've all that shown said, you, now that I've well shown you how well we can collectively work um, together. Um, why are we here? Uh, why are we here? Uh, over the past few weeks, over the past few weeks, this, we've seen really interesting, this really interesting yellow vest, yellow vest movement uh, emerge, uh, in France, emerge in um, France. In the context um, of, in the context know, of, the past you know, years, over the past few years, pretty, we've seen some big political big patterns, political patterns emerge patterns internationally, emerge, but especially internationally, in Europe. Especially in Europe the, uh, the center uh, sort of center sort of falling out and creating space for a rising far right in France. The far right national. Right, National Front, um, championed by um, championed Marine Le Pen, but also Marine creating Pen, space, but also for creating space the, for the left, the, the socialist the left movements, to finally get a foothold, finally get a foothold in mainstream in discourse, mainstream um, like Melanchthon's um, movement, like Melanchthon's like movement, movement, like France and Sunni's, uh, and, uh, um, and and um, you have figures and like you Macron, have figures trying like Macron to be trying the sort of last resort the sort of against the Pen, last resort against last resort against the far right, but really still right, but really still championing politics of the establishment, right? And in these big patterns, I don't. I don't think that anyone. Patterns, I don't think that anyone. People have gotten kind of people have gotten with kind of patterns, comfortable with these patterns. And I don't think that anyone expected, that anyone expected the emergence of this. The emergence uh, of this uh, gen it seems genuinely, it seems spontaneous, genuinely spontaneous, uh, spontaneous yellow vest uh, movement. Yellow vest movement. People from the peripheral people regions, from the peripheral France, regions in France, um, who are um, talked about, who are talked very about often, but very don't often, often but don't often get to speak for themselves. Speak for themselves at first glance. Don't first glance. Don't fit into all of the narratives that people have been talking about. Politics, talking about um, politics, but um, in some but ways, in they some ways, have they really come have to really fit come the political to movement, fit the perfectly. political movement, um, perfectly. and um, resonate and actually resonate with actually France's with deep, some of France's sort of deep, uh, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, traditions of resistance, uh, traditions right? of resistance, um, right? So, um, so uh, we have some uh, great panelists. We have some great to panelists tonight. to talk about this tonight. tonight. We have Jonah um, Birch, who is, um, who is contributing a editor at contributing Jacobin. editor at uh, Jacobin. He's uh, a sociologist, he's a sociologist who studies working class struggle in France. France. He's he's in France. France. Amazing in depth things about politics and history, the left in France. And we also have Kate Arnoff, who also writes for Jacobin. She's a contributor to the and a writing fellow at covering climate and covering politics. Well, she's not a writing fellow anymore. Sorry. And she recently, in Jackman, wrote a great piece on just this movement called Macron's Climate Tax is a Disaster. And in it, she said the Yellow Vest movement in France is raising up a vital message. Blame the fossil fuel industry and the rich for the ecological crisis, not ordinary people. I think that's a great framework for what we're about to talk about tonight. Um, so first, I'm going to pass it off to Jonah to talk about the general context of um, 
uh, politics in France, um, what you need to know to understand this movement, uh, where, where he thinks it's going, uh, and yeah, what it means for the left. Well, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, you know, so we were supposed to have a third person on this panel who's a French socialist on the ground, which isn't going to happen. Obviously, n neither of us are on the ground in these protests and, uh, you know, have, haven't been in France since the middle of November when they picked up. So there are going to be certain things that I'm not sure we know any better than you do, you know, what's happening. But the broader context, that I think, is uh, important here. And um, obviously, you know, I, I heard someone say on a, a podcast that maybe it'll turn out that research shows there was some kind of molecular organizing going on underneath this and we'll be able to, to trace the lineage of these protests. In some ways, it's very, it seems very difficult. They do seem like genuinely kind of spontaneous protests organized essentially on the internet. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, since November, uh, you know, originally, since around, November originally around rise in fuel taxes, obviously, rise in obviously, fuel taxes, uh, obviously touching on, uh, deeper, touching on issues in terms deeper issues in terms fiscal of fiscal inequality, the fiscal general, inequality, rise, of inequality, the general the rise of inequality, the neoliberalization of the French economy. Of the French economy. Uh, one of the things uh, that's really one of the incredible things that's about really them incredible is about them is broad, how, how widely broad, they've spread, how widely they've including spread, including into places that the, into places that the left has really had no base, has really had no base, places in rural France that, in a lot of ways, that in a lot of ways. Of have some of the brunt of fiscal some of the austerity of the last decade. Clearly, is something that's driving. Uh, but, not uh, but, not have, have, but not places where you have not places where you have unionization, not places where people traditionally vote for the left. Traditionally often vote for not the left. places. Where often not places where, where, where vote at all. Many people vote at all. Highly politicized. Highly politicized. The social base of the protest. The social base of the protest also seems to go pretty well beyond the well beyond the kind of traditional bastions of working class in France. Working class. I want to talk about the the. The, the context for these in a, a couple of, of different ways. Uh, the first way is the, the long-term effort, essentially, to restructure the, the French capitalism along neoliberal lines. Going, and that's been a project of uh, uh, political leaders in France, both left and right, going back uh, really several decades. And there's constantly this... Um, this uh, attempt to, to say that the economic problems that France faces and the difficulties around employment and pr since 2008, since the global financial crash of 2008, French capitalism is, has had a lot of difficulties recovering. Very, very high rates of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. Uh, obviously, inequality has been growing in France as it has across much of Europe, but there's been a sense that there hasn't been the sort of recovery you've seen elsewhere uh, and someone like uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, who is the president elected in 2017, uh, in part on the basis of promises to, to change this, to turn around this situation, well, makes the argument essentially that the, there is a, 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 the blockages to recovery have to do with the inability of France to go down a kind of German path of, of neoliberal restructuring, of, um, you know, and, and people see the German model of, of the last 15 years of increasingly unequal uh, employment growth is the, the, the way to go as the, uh, uh, by the way, we have our, yeah. our third presenter. Um, you know, so since really over the last 30 years, there's been an attempt to continue that. Macron, when he was labor minister under the last government, the government of Francois Hollande, who was the president from 2012 to 2017, um, was known for his, the labor law reforms that he was pushing very aggressively, often against major uh, opposition, attempts to, to restructure the French uh, labor market. And as president, he has attempted to uh, continue with those reforms and at the same time uh, uh, change the tax code, uh, already a very regressive tax code in France, uh, in ways that are going to benefit the rich and, and uh, hurt essentially poor and, and working class people. Um, now, in the past, when uh, in efforts to, to move France in that direction, and France has certainly gone very far in the direction of that kind of neoliberal restructuring, have consistently run up against these kind of social explosions. There's a myth about France in the United States that people go out on strike all the time. It's not true. In fact, strike rates have really collapsed since the 1970s, particularly in the public sector. What is true is that there are regularly these kinds of mass mobilizations on the ground against... 
uh, uh, government efforts to implement neoliberal reforms. And some of the famous ones over the last 30, uh, 30 years are the December 1995 public sector strike wave, which uh, against the proposed pension reform, which got a lot of support. Uh, and both in 2002, there were big protests against the far right, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who had made it to the second round of the presidential election that year. 2003, there was sort of an aborted movement against another pension reform. 2005, there was the movement against the European Constitutional Treaty, uh, which was really a left-led movement, which forced the rejection of that. 2006, there was a major movement against uh, an attempt to uh, introduce uh, kind of neoliberal labor law reforms hurting young workers. Again and again and again, you saw those, those mass movements. Uh, often those were led by the labor movement, unlike this one, and there was a sense, I think, in France over the last few years that maybe the era of those mobilizations, of those mass protests have died. In 2010, there was a major defeat of a big movement against another pension reform. And then in 2016, when uh, Macron was the, um, was the labor minister and pushed through a set of labor law reforms called the El Khomri law, uh, that was the major one, with the culmination of a series of uh, reforms in the labor market, there were big protests and at the same time a kind of movement of uh, young people in particular uh, called uh, Nuit Debout, sort of like a, a bit like an Occupy movement, kind of a movement of, of the squares. And when, when all of those laws were, were implemented over the last several years, I think there was a sense that, uh, that, yeah, that the era of mobilizations, mass protests against uh, neoliberal reforms was over. This has shattered that, I would say, and in very surprising ways. I mean, unlike those, those movements, for the most part, it isn't clear what the role of the kind of traditional centers of, um, of left opposition ha has been in leaving it, leading it. Certainly, you know, you've seen a, a, a real explosion again of kind of student protests since, the, since November, since you, uh, the, these... Um, you know, the, the Gilets Jaunes protests have started again. And you've seen some effort by the labor movement to get behind the protests and to uh, tack on to them uh, it, and, and I don't want to say use them, but join them and, and um, translate them into a, a set of concessions from the government. Now, it should be said, the labor movement, even most of the more left-wing sections of the labor movement, and we can get into this, have been pretty ambivalent in some ways about how they're approaching the, the protest movement. Um, calling solidarity demonstrations, three minutes. Okay. Um, and at the same time, calling for dialogue with the government and demanding that the protests be kind of peaceful and uh, avoid violence. Um, but definitely there is some effort of the labor movement to join them. At the same time, as people have talked about, there's an effort by the far right and the now national rally of Marine Le Pen to kind of claim them and if you read Marine Le Pen's Twitter feed or her public statements, she's obsessed with this um, UN immigration summit in Morocco, and she's like trying to use the protests as a way of attacking, uh, attacking the uh, you know immigration into France. And um, it's also clear that the dynamic of the protest is pushing people more towards the left. I would say that uh, not only are because most of the protesters. You know, many of them are people, again, who don't vote, who don't consider themselves part of the left or part of the right, uh, but uh, who are more sympathetic, I would say, to the demands emanating from the left, from the most part, it seems like. But also because the conflict with the state that you see every day, you know, and you guys have watched these videos, these protests on the Champs-Élysées, which is a, a bourgeois, uh, very wealthy uh, neighborhood in western Paris filled with tourists, and now you see people coming in from rural areas and having street fights with the police in front of you know, the Arc de Triomphe, uh, that is, is something that I, I think is putting people into conflict with the government. And Marine Le Pen, the far right, is very, can't decide whether they want to be with the protesters with the police. So there's a very interesting dynamic there. I would say generally, of course, the people that are hurt the most by this are, uh, you know, it's gonna be Macron. And right now, Macron's approval ratings are down below 20%, as are that of his government, the prime minister. Uh, Philippe also below, uh, right around 20% right now. The government is being seriously undermined by these, and you're seeing the continuation of pattern you've seen several times before, the last several administrations under Hollande, who was the Socialist Party uh, uh, president uh, 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 who 
preceded um, uh, Macron, and before him, Sarkozy, people who get elected promising big, these kind of big neoliberal structure, uh, well, that wasn't what Hollande, who, who came in promising big changes in the economy, I should say, and then very quickly try and push through these unpopular reform programs and see their popularity very dramatically undermined very quickly because of it. Uh, so you're seeing the same pattern today. It's interesting to think about uh, where things are going to go next. I don't think anyone knows, but yeah, I'll leave it to Kate. And we can talk more in the yeah. question section. And also, oh, great. Oh, great. Okay, so we are in, in the end, um, after Kate, going to hear from uh, our comrade in France. Uh, but actually, before we switch to Kate, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question, uh, which was about Marine Le Pen sort of being obsessed with taking an anti-immigrant narrative out of these protests yeah. um, uh, and projecting that from them. I was listening to the radio about Macron's sort of famous concessions to the movement. He's raised the minimum wage. He's yeah. uh, agreed to all kinds of other me measures, apparently. Um, uh, but also that in that same sort of package of concessions, he announced that he was going to be harder on immigration. Um, so the feeling I got from that was that Macron also has some interest in painting the protests as anti-immigrant. Um, yep. What would you say about sort of the struggle among parties to either understand or project this movement as either left or right, xenophobic or, you know, redistributionist or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think Emre from France can probably speak better to that, what's happening right now. Clearly, there is an effort by people in the center and the government to paint it in, as sort of uh, irrational, and particularly to paint it as a movement of the far right, I would say. Violent, irrational, racist, um, and you see that dynamic going on. I mean, my impression is that, the, um, and again, Emre can speak more to this, uh, is that, um, that the, so Macron formed his, his, the government that he heads is formed out of a new party, which he just created, the En Marche, the Republic, um, uh, you know, En Marche. Um, and it was formed out of remnants of the Socialist Party, which really collapsed at the end of, uh, you know, kind of the right wing elements of the Socialist Party, which collapsed at, at the end of the Hollande administration, and tried to present itself again as kind of above politics, neither left nor right. I mean, that was the basis on which it won this election in 2017. A lot of the people who were elected to the parliament from this party were new to politics. And it was very much a kind of personal vehicle of, of Macron, but at the same time was trying to do this kind of we're in the center, whatever's best for France, neither left nor right thing. Uh, and I think that they have been totally thrown off by this. They have no idea what to do right now. It's amazing to watch, actually. I mean, Macron tries to present himself as the new Obama, the difference being that whatever you want to say about Obama's politics, the guy was a good politician. You know what I mean? He really was. I don't think you could say the same thing about, about Macron. Uh, and I think the people who he, he, he's brought into his party and made the kind of leadership don't know what to do. But certainly, there is an interest of the far right in claiming the protests and of the people in the center in, in uh, attributing it to the far right both things at once. Okay, thank you, Jonah. Um, now we're gonna hear from Kate um, about the really interesting part about these protests, which the, is that they emerged um, uh, in part against this fuel tax, um, but as they've progressed, can't really be labeled as anti-environmental you know, environmental progress, anti-green uh, transition. Um, and so Kate's gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of regressive climate policy versus progressive climate policy in this context. Yeah. Hey everyone, um, it's cool to see such a big room uh, here for this. Um, yeah, so I uh, just want to give a little bit of context, which uh, to say mostly comes from talking to, to comrades who do work in France and who are involved with the climate movement in France. Um, just about about sort of that that particular context. So. Um, there was a fairly big climate march in uh, Paris and in cities around France um, in early September. Um, that was part of the sort of like global day of, of mobilization around climate called Rise for Jobs, Climate and Justice. Um, the, the showing in France was particularly big and, and, and particularly interesting because um, I think a couple days before um, Nicolas Hulot, 
um, had resigned um, from his post as uh, environment minister or whatever the equivalent of that is um, in France, and he was sort of this um, public figure, um, very well-known environmentalist, um, and resigned basically because the Macron government was not doing enough on climate, and that became very clear um, during the course of his tenure in Macron's administration. Um, and so when the Yellow Jacket protest emerged um, not too long after that, um, there was a sort of chill from, from, from what I've, I've heard from folks about, you know, being nervous, basically. Um, is this, you know, a real reaction to um, environmental policies? Is this sort of a, a popular backlash against um, not just the policies of the Macron government, but um, to these mobilizations, which had been larger than sort of any climate protest in France in, um, in recent memory, probably since uh, the Paris climate talks in 2015. Um, when there was a big mobilization on the last day. Um, and so, you know, there was this initial kind of chill and, and, and uncertainty about that, and then um, very quickly to hear, hear folks there tell it, um, became clear that this was really an issue of tax justice, um, that it was not sort of an issue, um, at, you know, other things as well, um, but not sort of some organic uprising against, um, you know, the idea that we need to um, do something about the climate, um, that there needs to be um, a sort of corrective to our horribly destructive relationship to the planet, um, but to the fact that these policies were very transparently being um, coming on the backs of the poor, right? And so there was a, about a $2 billion um, hole in the French budget left by um, a tax cut on the rich. Um, the fuel tax would fill a $2 billion hole. Um, so that, that relationship, I think, was very obvious um, to folks who were watching it. Um, I'd be curious to hear sort of more about how that, how that felt on the ground as well. Um, but it, it sort of highlighted the fact that um, Macron um, and that a, a whole sort of crew of environmentalists um, at the international level um, have this sort of approach to climate politics, which is um, increasingly becoming clear as, as politically just toxic. Um, and so I uh, was in Poland um, while, while most of the, the sort of biggest demonstrations um, of the Yellow Jacket protests so far were happening. Um, and uh, that, it was interesting to watch sort of people respond to it, um, in part because for the past couple of years, the, the um, Conference of Parties, um, this was COP24, um, have kind of taken place with a background of rising right populism um, in the background. So during the Paris climate talks in 2015, um, during the course of those talks, Marine Le Pen won a first round of elections um, in, in, in France um, as this was happening. Uh, during the talks in 2016, Donald Trump was elected just before um, those talks in Marrakesh. Um, during the talks last year in Bonn, Angela Merkel's government uh, in Germany was on the verge of sort of losing its coalition. Um, and of course this year, what, what was sort of expected to be the sort of populist story there um, was the fact that the talks were happening in Polish coal country. Um, and there's been a sort of uprising of uh, neo-Nazis in, in Poland. Um, so that, that was actually less of the story, although it, you know, we can talk about the sort of far right elements um, present in those talks. Um, but it's kind of highlights the fact that the, what's happening sort of inside um, the halls of, of these international climate talks um, and the kind of elite approach to environmentalism in general that is sort of dominant there um, is just totally out of touch with what seems to be needed on this front, both in terms of um, what the kind of political context seems to be um, certainly in, you know, places like the U.S. and um, kind of parts of Europe uh, and with sort of what's needed on climate. So not only were Macron's policies, um, you know, uh, very rightfully provoking backlash um, from, from the French public, um, they also aren't what's needed to get us off of fossil fuels, which is a massive transition um, as quickly as possible away from that and a massive buildup, um, which of course involves massive amounts of public investment um, and going after the uh, 100 corporations which have been responsible for 71% of greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. Um, and so his, his policies very clearly um, don't do that. Um, and it's, it's been really interesting just to watch people respond to it. I mean, particularly from uh, the US in, in regard to this. Um, in part because they're, for being a, a fight that lends itself so well to a kind of left populism, to um, a sort of targeting of 
elites, of corporations. Um, the climate fight has really um, very rarely been that, in part because sort of public consciousness around climate change emerged um, as neoliberalism was sort of reaching its zenith. So um, in the US, James Hansen um, gave his testimony to Congress about global warming and the sort of imminent threat it posed um, in 1988, um, sort of in the, in the midst of, of what um, was a neoliberal government and continued to be a very neoliberal um, government for a long time. Um, and so the fight has always been framed as sort of an issue of personal sacrifice, as an issue of um, giving up something. And so that's um, how climate policy has often been framed. And, and in the U.S. Um, and in many parts of the world, um, what that's meant is that the sort of go-to policy we think of for climate is a carbon tax, right? And we can talk more about sort of the specifics of, car of carbon tax. Um, you know, I think very few people would say we don't need some sort of price on carbon. Um, but uh, it, it kind of buys into the sort of neoliberal fantasy that if we just get the prices right, if we just sort of provide the right market signals, um, this whole problem will go away and we can trust the market um, to fix this instead of really being very clear about um, who the enemies are. And there are very, very clear enemies in, in this fight. Um, and they are not French commuters, right? Um, they're not people trying to drive diesel cars to work. Um, and I think, you know, what the, what the Yellow Jacket protests really make clear, I think, for, for uh, as someone who's been following climate politics for a long time, um, is that, A, there, you, you can't really have climate politics in the context of austerity. Um, and that if you're asking people to give up anything at all, um, which I don't, again, I don't think is a, is a takeaway um, for what we need. Climate politics is an issue of investment. It's not an issue of sacrifice. It's about giving you know, society's vast resources to many people rather than letting them accumulate for the few. Um, it, it sort of shows that if you are trying to create climate policies which um, are asking people to give something up, it's, it's impossible to imagine that getting any political traction um, if you are also sort of doing things like cutting public transit, right? So these cutting sort of needed low carbon investments. Um, if you're doing things like asking people um, to watch as Total, one of the biggest uh, oil companies in France, um, pays basically nothing in taxes, right? Um, and so there's a very clear issue of inequality. And, I know, and that's not to say that um, there aren't real complications, I think, in, in the movement, which I'm excited um, you know, to hear more about. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't think it, it, it can cleanly be called, you know, one thing or the other, um, but that the, the takeaway from this is certainly not that um, the French public hates uh, the environment <laughs> and that, that the French working class is, is just opposed to any sort of uh, climate, climate protest. And so um, I think what this really sort of should show to folks in the U.S. context in particular, which is where I spend most of my time thinking about um, is really that the path forward is not um, a kind of you know, neoliberal suite of policies that um, you know, Macron, along with folks who um, folks might be more familiar with, like Michael Bloomberg, um, or... Um, similar. Yeah, similar, very similar, similar um, figures. Um, but, but that sort of approach, A, is, is dead on arrival um, and, and, and won't sort of you know, get us off of fossil fuels. Um, and sort of shows the clear need that, that any climate policy needs to massively, massively invest in um, making working people's lives better um, or else it will fail. Um, and I think you know, this is sort of a canary in the coal mine, so to speak, for what we can expect here, right? If, if we, you know, were, if, if, if a sort of center left government were to, were to come into power tomorrow um, and enact a carbon tax in the name of climate, I think we would probably see some form of protest in part because working people's lives are still hard and this is a regressive tax. Um, and the sort of answer to that from the um, you know, liberal sort of center left of today has been that if you know, we can pass a carbon tax that does need to be the policy that we pursue, um, we just need to meet out a sort of redistributive element through the tax, um, through the tax code um, and, and sort of give people some part of that money back um, once a year, which um, I think is, is, speaks to just how sort of out of touch um, a lot of the climate movement is. And, and, and the climate sort of um, glitterati is, is what climate uh, scientist Kevin Anderson has called um, this, this crew of people. You could also refer to them as sort of Davos environmentalists, another, um, another phrase. 
Um, but that I, I think we have, what's exciting about this moment um, is that we have a real alternative on, on the table to this, which is a sort of politics emerging around the Green New Deal, um, which remains to be sort of totally defined. It remains a sort of floating signifier for many people. Andrew Cuomo, I think, came out um, in support of it today. Um, but um, I think the, the framework that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's team has been very clear about um, is that that really is a massive amount of public investment um, not just in getting off of fossil fuels in the next 10 years, as is manifestly clear from every climate study that's come out um, in, in the last few years, um, but also in massively investing to virtually eliminate poverty, um, which is what the sort of language of that resolution states. Um, and so I think that, that having these two things sort of play out at the same time is very helpful um, just for framing the climate debate. Um, I think it's very clarifying to show that you know, one set of policies is clearly going to fail and will clearly provoke massive protests, um, and another set of policies enjoys sort of massive public support. There was a study that came out today from the Yale Center on the Environment, um, which showed that there is 92% support for a Green New Deal among registered Democrats, um, and I think it was 62% among Republicans, and 57% among um, cons self-identified conservative Republicans who are registered voters, right? And so, um, <laughs> We, this, I think about 72% of the French public supported the yellow jacket protest yeah. or something like that. So, yeah, so I think this is not a hard thing to figure out. And if you are looking for a climate um, policy to grasp onto and looking for a, a big re redistributive policy to grasp onto, um, I think these two, these two things really, really help, help show you the way to what that might look like. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'm so glad I'm not part of the climate glitterati. Uh, <laughs> so now we're going to hear from Emre. Um, uh, Emre, we sort of want to know from you, by the way, he is a uh, CGT militant. That's a big union in France, uh, uh, in Paris. Uh, and he's going- And he's what big brother. Apparently. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and what we're hoping to know about is what have been the, the dynamic of the protests on the ground. Um, how has the position of the left and unions evolved towards um, these protests? And what do you think is next? Uh, where is this going? Um, good evening to, uh, sorry. Good evening to everyone. Uh, sorry for the uh, do you hear me? It's okay. Yes. Yeah, you hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, All good of evening to watching everyone. You right Sorry now. for the for the fact that I was a little bit late at the beginning. Um, uh, the dynamic after uh, the last weekend of after the Saturday doesn't seem very good. Uh, in the sense that it seems the participation uh, to demonstrations, at least in Paris, were lower than the, week, than the weeks before. Uh, but I am very uh, careful, uh, careful about any uh, evaluation of the mobilization uh, because we are, we are uh, in because it's a mobilization, it's a movement that. Uh, that is very different the way uh, that it acts, and we don't we don't have the tools to evaluate it properly. Um, the demonstrations in Paris, uh, you have to figure that they are not real demonstrations. There is no people uh, gathering in point A to go to point B, uh, like in the Champs Elysees. It's not like that. You have many different places, many different people uh, gathering at many different places, and there are demos uh, from those different places uh, with the police intervention. So people dissolve their uh, gatherings. They uh, they gather in another place, uh, and so it's not a real demo. It's a very uh, it's very molecular in some in some way, so it's very difficult to evaluate. Um, the thing is that uh, 
the second thing is that because of police and judicial uh, repression, uh, this was much more difficult for people to come to Paris and uh, to do to participate to demonstrations um, because most of uh, those peoples uh, these last weekends uh, come from outside of Paris, outside of Paris area. So that's the first thing. But we can see in other cities, in other towns, in smaller towns, that uh, the demonstrations and which are often more classic, uh, are were not that uh, were not weaker than the weeks before. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that in fact the number of people uh, participating to these demos and riots in Paris or in different cities and areas is not that much big. In fact, if you even if in the most optimistic, um, with the most optimistic numbers, uh, we had much more important demonstrations these last years uh, in France. But what is different is that uh, that these demos became uh, kind of riots in some places, and that despite that there is a massive. Uh, support in the population and uh, in the lower income in the lower po income population. That's and didn't change much uh, during all these weeks. And uh, despite despite all the discourse about the violence and the riots and so on, um, I think that uh, there is um, there is two or three points, uh, three or three issues which are uh, very new or specific to this mobilization, to the yellow vest uh, mobilization. Um, first, it showed that uh, it showed the, um, somehow the limits of the implementation uh, of the basis of political left, but also um, mass uh, mass organizations like unions. To give you a to give you a brief example, first, uh, when this movement appeared, uh, many people on the left, including myself, were wrong uh, because uh, we assimilated it to a extreme right to an extreme right mobilization because there were. Facebook figures and social media, uh, social network figures of the extreme right that were very supportive of it. And we didn't get the social, uh, the social, uh, the social dimension of what was going on. We got it after the first weekend of mobilization, after the 17th November. But until then, we didn't, many people, not everyone, but many people, didn't get it, and they got it after. Or in the unions, for example, uh, a friend who is an activist in the city of Paris uh, Public Servants Union uh, explained that in the first time there were members of the union from the lower ranks of the uh, public servants who were very enthusiastic about the yellow vests. But the officials of the union told them, no way, you can't support it. It's a movement of the extreme right. You, you can't go there. And so they, they were, so they backed off. And with the, with the different, uh, with the mobilization of the Yellow Vest developing, those officials say, no, in fact, Yellow Vest, we have to support it. We have to go with them. But uh, those ones, the first supporters, no, they are much more. Uh, they are much more. Uh, they are not active anymore because they were not supported by their officials in the first time. Um, so that's the. So we we see the limits of our own social uh, implementation of our own uh, comprehension of the society. That's the first thing. The second thing, which is more positive, is that the yellow vest 
had an impact on uh, on different um, social movements that were already existing, and in part and particularly uh, the uh, ecologist uh, movement, the environmental movement. Uh, the, the the last climate march that uh, was two weeks before uh, was very interesting from this point of view. There were uh, many people in this march, despite the fact that some mediatic pictures of ecology said uh, you shouldn't do this climate march now as there are riots, you should, Adam, you should forget it. And there were many people and with a uh, with real, uh, important, interesting social content, uh, with this slogan, the end of the world and the end of the month, which means that enough money at the end of the month, I hope that. Uh, so the end of the world and the end of the month are, are the same problem. So giving to the ecologist movement uh, a strong uh, social uh, economical uh, content, which is some, which is something quite new in France. So it, in fact, it brought the yellow vest, for example, brought ecology movement to the left. The other thing, which is the other point, which is very important, uh, is that there is now um, an antagonistic relation with the capital state in uh, in masses, I, as I told you, in fact, there is not that much people involved participating actively to the uh, yellow vest protest or blockade, but they are massive. There is a massive support, and the police repression, which is really very strong, um, brings this antagonistic relation with the state. Now there are many, 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 for example, uh, video footage of all this violence, which already existed before, but now it is shared very, very, uh, very largely by people who didn't care, who, who didn't know, who didn't care, already were not, who are not, who are not activists. And there is this uh, conscience of Police violence, state violence, which are, which is uh, skyrocketing, and this is very impressive. There are videos that have been seen millions of times. And one positive aspect of it is, for example, that I don't say that I don't say that it's the case everywhere, but it's quite large and it's quite interesting. Uh, the connection that, that can exist with uh, what is uh, what a, what has to endure uh, the young people, the non-white young people uh, in uh, suburban areas? There, there was like two weeks before, in uh, there was a high school student of a suburban school who were arrested and put on their knees during hours by police officers. And there is a video footage of it. And it created a, a huge outrage. Um, but it created also a connection with many, uh, uh, with, uh, many yellow vests and who repeated the uh, uh, fact, who, who repeated the same act to 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 be on their knees and uh, to be to, they put themselves on their knees to protest against the, uh, the the police repression. Um, so symbolically connecting themselves themselves with this young uh, with this with this high school student must be non white. So this is very uh, interesting to see that that people do this kind of connection and. Um, and I finish maybe with that. Uh, this is something which is very feared by the extreme right. In fact, extreme right tries to have uh, an influence on this movement, and um, 
Jonah told about it with his Marrakesh pact and uh, about the nonsense that they say about the Marrakesh pact. But they are very, uh, they are very weak on the issue of police violence, on the issue of the connection with other police violences. And that's an angle of uh, intervention, which is uh, very uh, interesting for the left. And the last thing I would say is about the, is about the union, the unions and the involvement of the union, uh, of the unions to this movement. Uh, as uh, told, a uh, member of CGT, in fact, um, the union, uh, the unions in France are very fragmented of many different confederations. One of the most important is CGT, which is, uh, which is left, to put it, put it uh, briefly. Um, as I told before, the yellow path had a good influence on the ecologist movement, but also showed how, uh, the, the limits, at least, limits of the Union Federation's leadership. Uh, one week, uh, one week, one week aspect of this mobilization are the Union's leadership. Um, first, the Union's uh, did a common the different unions, except the one, uh, Solidar, which is the most leftist one, uh, did a common statement, which was a disastrous one, uh, only talking about the violence of the rioters and so on. And very, uh, it was almost like a government wrote statement. And uh, that's the first problem. But that's not the only one, because, uh, for example, CGT, is uh, reproducing a tactic which is which has always failed to, to action days, which is like one day actually one day of action. It is something very uh, very unnecessary and it never worked. In fact, there is a demo of uh, CGT officials and no one uh, else, and it doesn't have any impact. And they did this the 14th of uh, December, so the, the day before uh, the demonstrations, the Saturday, uh, Saturday demonstrations. So it was seen by many uh, as an operation to divide but the, the 14, the unionists do their things, and the 15, the, the yellow vests do their things. And of course, the 14th of December, there was almost no one in the street, even from the CGT, and it was a failure. And because it was a failure, they called to make another uh, action day, because they don't change, uh, uh, tomorrow. And there will be no one tomorrow in the streets. But that's only... Uh, so they are reproducing a business as usual, which, is, which has already failed but in a situation which is not business as well. And on the plus side, and I finish with the plus side, there are some areas where there is a connection uh, where the local union leaderships and activists uh, act in much more active way. Uh, and there are places where there is this connection like Toulouse and Saint Nazaire and so on, and we have to. And I finish with that. Uh, we have to to follow this movement. We have really to have to focus on what happened in uh, uh, different regions in uh, middle level uh, towns, and not that much in Paris area. But uh, compute. We don't know what will come before because we didn't get what was coming. We didn't have any idea how it to develop. And I'm sorry, I cannot tell if it will go on from now because we have really no idea. But it is still exciting, and um, that has this positive impact. So, to politicize some sectors and to create a mass level antagonistic perception of the capital.
thank you so much, Emre. I think there are some important lessons for our own left in institutions and unions there. And it is past midnight in France uh, by this point. So we, past, yeah. yeah, we're very lucky to have heard from him. Um, I'm going to open it up for discussion um, now. Some questions from the floor. Eric is going to be our Q&A mic runner. Um, I think we're going to take it three at a time, and then there, if there are questions in there, throw it back to our panelists to see if they want to respond to any of them. I, I think you are more able to. So could folks just yeah. raise their hand if they want to speak? I'm going to try to do progressive stacks so we have a diverse group of folks asking questions.